I stand before you, Lord, with my arms outstretched and my heart wide open. So, Lord, I ask for your power on this. I ask for your anointing on this. I ask, Lord, that you just break this place free, that your anointing... No, it's not even the anointing. Lord, it's your promise. It's all the things that have ever been prophesied over this people as individuals, families, and as a flock. God, break it free today, in Jesus' name. As you know, we're kind of replanting this church right now. It's like we're starting again, being rebuilt, and that means reestablishing foundational values and foundational principles, foundational truths that make us who we are. It means that we're kind of solidifying the core character of who we are in the Lord as a people. This is not a new message today. So if you've been around a long time and you think you're hearing something you've heard before, look interested, <laughs> all right? Because we need to reestablish some things. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, and the verses after that. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. And we were all made to drink of one spirit, for the body is not one member but many. And if the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I'm not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I'm not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them in the body, just as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it's much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary and those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor, and our less presentable members become much more presentable, whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked, so that there may, may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. Now listen, the universe operates by law. And I don't mean rules and legalism. I don't mean that list of rules that everybody wants to lay on you. I mean, you know, those religious rules. I mean that things work the way they work by natural laws and no amount of human denial no amount of manipulation, no amount of wishful thinking can change those laws. They are absolute and they are unchangeable. Nobody can say, I don't believe in the law of gravity. I remember back in, in, in the 60s, some folks would get high on LSD and they would think and they would feel, I can fly. And some of them jumped off, jumped off roofs and got killed. Natural law doesn't care what you think. Natural law doesn't care what you feel. Spiritual laws are just as real and just as absolute. God didn't create two universes, he created one, and the same laws apply in both places. Natural law and spiritual law are the same laws. Every action produces an equal and opposite reaction. That's the same as you will, what you sow you will reap. Same law. Energy cannot be destroyed. It can only be changed into another form. And that's the same as be transformed by the renewal of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is. It's the same mind, it's the same energy, it's just changed, it's renewed. And if you wanna think of it this way, love is a form of energy that can't be destroyed, but if you focus it in the wrong direction, it becomes forms of hatred in the name of love. It morphs. Energy can't be destroyed, it just takes another form. I'm just illustrating laws of the universe, the physical universe, that apply in the spiritual universe. So the enemy of our soul opposes the kingdom of God, and what he does is he works to twist those laws to our disadvantage so that those laws don't work for our benefit, so that we lose the blessing, so that the energy of our lives 
morphs into other forms of energy that hinder and destroy. Now, the focus today is the law of oneness. And what happens when we work with that law? What happens when we work in that law? The principle is that oneness between human beings releases power. I don't know why we haven't seen a lot of revival in America, I'll tell you. Right there's the root. Oneness releases power. Things get built. Things get done. Now, I'm not talking just about unity. Unity is a really weak word. It's overused. I hate that word. It's worn out. I'm done. In the body of Christ, it seems, I mean, through the years, it has seemed like we equate the word unity with mass meetings and cooperative events between churches and things like that. And I've seen very little fruit come from those things except in isolated cases in cities here and there. Unity doesn't take us far enough. It doesn't take us far enough into the mystery of God. I've worked for unity my whole career and I've seen a lot of activity come from it and I've seen a lot of energy expended but I haven't seen very little real power. I've heard lip service. I've heard people say that they love one another and that their hearts are clean. And then I've seen them undercut and backstab one another in the next, in the next hour. Most of my life, unity has been little more than just a religious word like a poster on a wall. It covers a lot of space, but it's paper thin. Oneness, on the other hand, Oneness is, is, is a state of deep, profound resonance of heart and spirit. It's deeper, it's different than the shallow water of what we call unity. It's the kind of love that led Jesus to become one with us to such a degree that in that oneness he took upon himself our sin and died in our place. It's the kind of oneness of mind that formed the foundation of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that filled the disciples on the day of Pentecost and rocked the world. Acts 1.14, these all with one mind. Doesn't mean they were all thinking the same. It means their hearts, their disposition, their focus, their attitude, that was all in the same place. There was a resonation. With one mind were continually devoting themselves to prayer. And then Acts 2.1, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place and power fell on them and miracles happened. Lives were changed. People got a revelation of who Jesus is and they fell all over themselves to get saved. It began with one mind. One that starts with the nature of God himself. Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Eloheinu Echad. In the Hebrew, there are two words for one. They come from the same root, but there's two words. Yahid means absolute one, no internal variation at all. Echad means one with an internal plurality. Echad is the word used in that prayer, the Shema, the foundation of Judeo-Christianity. Here, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Echad. One. Oneness with an an internal plurality. So the very strength of God is vested in the plurality, plurality of his nature that exists forever without negating the oneness. And if you think you got that figured out, you just became a heretic. Even the word for God The singular for God is El in the Hebrew. But when you refer to the God, the God, the only God, the true God, it's Elohim, the plural. And so even his name, his proper name is plural, Elohim. One God in three persons, perfect love, perfect resonance between them. See, the power of God is woven into the oneness of his own nature as three in one. It's not just a unity, it's a oneness. Without stress, without struggle, without barrier, it's oneness steeped in honor, each member of the Trinity honoring each other member of the Trinity. Are you following me in this? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve knew that kind of oneness before they wrecked it with sin. 
God created us in his image. He created us to reflect his nature, to mirror him in some mysterious way that's not shared by the creatures. It's all embedded in the oneness of the Godhead being written into this. Listen to how it's written. Genesis 127. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Genesis 2.24, for this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall be joined to his wife and they shall become what? One flesh. See, we were designed for strength that would be magnified in a oneness expressed in the two become one. Oneness releases power greater than the sum of the individual parts. The oneness between Adam and Eve looked like and reflected the oneness that exists in the plurality of the one God. We were built for this. We were made for this. We were designed for this. And so together, the man and the woman reflect God's image. And in that oneness, something infinitely greater than the sum of their parts gets released. They are multiplied in power. It reads, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created him. There's this thing in Hebrew and in other languages we call juxtaposition. When you put two things in juxtaposition next to each other like that, it means that one equals the other. One defines the other. He created man in his image, male and female he created them. Something about the oneness of man and woman. The the oneness of man and woman that was designed to reflect the nature of God. We're built for this. Apart, apart, the man and the woman are just a man and a woman. They're not much different than the other creatures. But when they're created as man who is male and female as one, they reflect an image together that's greater than the sum of the two of them. They look like God in a oneness that's plural. One flesh expressed in two persons. Now I'm not saying that you're less if you're not married. That's not the point. God designed that there would be a oneness, a unity between men and women. And have you seen the enemy trying to tear that apart? Creation responded to that oneness. Creation rendered up its produce and rendered up its sustenance to Adam freely. Now imagine, think think of this, imagine, here's a whole creation full of plants and animals all kinds of things. Imagine the mental power of a man created in God's image who could name every creature in existence as scripture says Adam did. Power released in oneness. He could could name and remember every creature. I can't even remember the names of all the people in this room. Please don't be offended. (laughs) Yeah. Beth and I, one flesh. If there were two of me, the two of me together would be weaker in ministry and weaker in life than Beth and me together. Together we are a power that looks like two plus two equals eight. That's bad math, but it's great theology. And so Satan works over time to destroy marriages and set men and women against one another and break up the oneness that God intended so that he can destroy us as individual people and he can destroy us as a society and he can destroy us as a culture and destroy us as a church. The enemy wants to weaken us, wants to take advantage of us in order to advance a demonic agenda. And I'll tell you what, as the left has advanced the narrative of male dominance and victimization of women and his masculinity has been increasingly despised in this culture. Have you seen the increase in broken families and sexual perversion over the last 40 to 50 years? Hello. You know what, it even affects us physically. Do you realize that sperm counts in men are down something, what is it, it, 60%, I can't remember the exact percentage. Testosterone levels are down by dozens of percentages in men. Men are, 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 men are, as men are developing, they're smaller because there's a physical effect to a 40 or 50 year war on men. 
in order to weaken and to divide and for us not to know who we are. First Peter 3, 7, you husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker, he means physically weaker. If you think, if you're married and you think your wife is uh, weaker than you emotionally, we need to have a talk. <laughs> in an under way, understanding way, as with someone weaker since she's a woman, and show her honor, honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. To sum up, let all of you, married or not, be harmonious, sympathetic, brotherly, kind-hearted, humble in spirit, not returning evil for insult or insult, or evil for evil or insult for insult, but giving a blessing instead. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. Now, when the man and, and the woman are one and equal, a power greater than the sum of the two of them is set in motion with two outcomes in an increase of power. One, your prayers are released and not hindered. Two, you inherit a blessing that affects your life in time and in eternity. But you have to fight for it. You have to decide for it. You have to sacrifice for it. There's a price to pay. Sometimes it's not easy to be harmonious and sympathetic and brotherly and kind-hearted and humble in spirit. Not returning evil for insult, evil for evil or an insult for an insult, but giving a blessing instead. Oneness. Oneness with a mate, oneness with others in the body of Christ will make you and us a force that cannot be defeated in life or in ministry. It is the natural law of the universe, the way God designed things to work. It's a principle of the universe like the law of gravity or like the law of physics. God knew the principle because he wrote it into creation and then you get the story of the Tower of Babel. I want to share it because I want to illustrate the principle. There came a time, wasn't long after Adam's fall, when humanity united in sin, came together in oneness, in sin, and it resulted in a release of tremendous power, but there was an unholy focus. It's the way the universe works, but there was an unholy focus, and God had to put it down in order to prevent a cosmic disaster. Most of you know the story of Tower of Babel. Man's arrogance had grown to such a point that he thought, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna build this tower, I'm gonna send to heaven. Genesis 11:4 says, by building a tower whose top will reach into heaven and let us make for ourselves a name. Well, the, nor, the Lord knows the power of oneness. He built that principle into the universe and it works whether you believe or not. It's how he designed it to work. He knew what it would release and so he took action to block what they were doing in order to prevent what might have been a cosmic disaster. And so Genesis eleven six, 6, the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they all have the same language and this is what they began to do. And now, listen to how he puts it, nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them because of oneness. Nothing that they would attempt would be impossible. And so the law of oneness the release is a power greater than the sum of the people operated even in sin because it's a law of the universe. Same way as the law of physics works. Genesis eleven seven. 7. God says, he's talking to himself now. Remember, God is a plurality. Three. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth and they stopped building the city. So he broke up their oneness that was focused on something ungodly and he did it in order to prevent a disaster because he understood his own principles. I'll just insert this. If you think that you're gonna overcome your obstacle, you think that you're gonna get out of your depression by isolating, you're lying to yourself. Because the power is in the oneness. Here it is for the body of Christ, Psalm 133. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down on the edge of his robes. That image is of the anointing power to be a priest. So unity is like that anointing that comes to empower you. And here's the next part. 
It's like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion. There were dry areas. The dew would fall up on the mountain and then it would run just like we have here. We got water running down from the mountains right now. If we didn't have the snow, we wouldn't have a Denver. It was the same thing there. The dew would fall on the mountains of Hermon and it would run down so they could water their fields. So he says unity is like that. It will produce fruit. Standing in oneness produces fruit. And then he says, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. In the oneness, God commands the blessing. If you don't have the oneness, you cut off the blessing. Life forever. See, when God looks down on us and he sees that oneness, he sees the essence of his own nature. And then he blesses that according to his own law. See, oneness releases power that makes us more than we would be as individuals. And it's all about the image, the image of God reflected in us. One, oneness in the Godhead mirrored in us. John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. And for Jesus, that oneness was the source of his power and his authority. Two plus two equals eight. And if it works in the world without the Holy Spirit, just because God designed us to work that way like it did at Babel, how much more would it and will it work in the body of Christ when we're empowered by the Holy Spirit and directed toward a godly purpose? How much favor would be released? You know, for a number of years, I'll just be honest, for a number of years, no matter how hard I tried, this church suffered broken oneness. Even as we preached the Father's heart, broken oneness. And since the sources of that brokenness have been removed, no longer with us, we've seen more healings, we've experienced more of the presence of God than we have for many years. Am I talking the truth? See, there's a power released in oneness that goes beyond just the absence of conflict. It's the resonance of heart that manifests in honor that's given and it's mercy granted in sacrifice for one another, blessings given and resources shared. Openings have come to us to touch and bless people outside of our faith. We've been empowered for that. Two plus two equals eight. After Jesus ascended into heaven, the disciples held that 10 day prayer meeting I keep talking about as they waited for the promise of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the empowering to come. I know it was 10 days because Jesus was with them 40 days after Passover. Pentecost is 50 days after Passover. So he ascended into heaven and they waited 10 days until the day of Pentecost. These all with one mind, continually devoting themselves to prayer along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. And again, the language, one mind. Oneness is a power magnifier. Oneness opens the floodgates of heaven. Oneness increases the power of the individuals that are involved beyond the sum of their parts. Here's the important part, I've said it before, I'll say it again, God will only bless what looks like him. Don't be asking him to bless plans that don't fit his agenda. He looks down on oneness, sees something there that looks like himself and he sends the magnified blessing. You know, without oneness there can't be any real Pentecost. Can't be a real revival. Because without oneness, we don't reflect God's nature. The three who are one. Acts two, verse one. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. You know the story. The sound of a mighty wind, filled with the Holy Spirit. Flames on their heads. I said this before, but I keep waiting for the smell of burning hair in God's, in God's house. I was drunk on the Holy Spirit. Saw some of that right down here today. Speaking in tongues, miraculously praising God in the languages of those who had come to Jerusalem for the, for the feast, feast of Pentecost. Peter preached, church instantly grew from 120 in the upper room to more than 3,000. And that was just the men. And it was in large part because oneness opened the floodgates of heaven. Prepared them to receive. Power had a landing place. What the 120 shared looked a lot like the image of God. One mind. I don't believe it was that they were all of one mind just praying for the power to come. 
I believe that the prayer had to do with resonant oneness in love. I believe it had to do with resolution of differences. I believe it had to do with honoring one another, with forgiving one another, with repenting of sin. He breathed on them in John 20 to deal with sin and they acted on it. There was a sense of being tuned to one another in, in heart, in desire, in purpose, in guidance, and in love. Do we want a real Pentecost? Or are we playing games? Are we looking for nice church? Or are we looking for God to make the kind of mess he made on the day of Pentecost? I want a sovereign God, not an obedient God. There's a difference. Yeah? I want an I outpouring filled with healings. Lives changed, families restored, miracles of provision. See, and if that's what we want, then our oneness as a people needs to reflect the oneness in the Godhead so that he can look down on us and see his own nature reflected back to him and into that he'll pour real power. John 17, 11, I am no longer in the world and yet they themselves are in the world and I come to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, the name which you have given me that they may be one even as we are. It means it's a a level of resonance among us that makes no sense, that can't be described, that can't be defined. It can be sensed and experienced, but you can't find words for it. One God, not three. Three persons, but not three gods. One, yet a plurality, perfect oneness, no strife, no struggle, perfect harmony in three who are one, and then that reflected in the oneness we enjoy together. See, I, I, I just passed the 43-year mark for full-time ministry. And, and I can tell you, there's always somebody saying, why didn't I get noticed? Why didn't I get time? I've been here a long time, I deserve this, or that, or whatever it is. You know, somebody's always muttering like that. You would never see the Holy Spirit complaining that all he ever gets to do is reveal the Father and the Son. You never hear Jesus, you know, saying, how come, how come, Jesus, the Father, how come, how come you make me do all the hard stuff? Why don't you come down here and bleed? You know, you don't hear Jesus complaining about his rights. You don't hear Jesus complaining about what he's entitled to. According to Philippians 2, he gave all that up to become a man. He emptied himself. So it's love and it's servanthood and it's resonant, selfless oneness as we are one, he said. And when he sees himself in that, he releases power. And I believe that he will not fully bless or empower anything that doesn't look like him. True oneness cannot be explained. True oneness shouldn't work. It makes no sense. It's a mystery. This church shouldn't work because we're not any kind of a homogeneous grouping here. We don't look alike. We don't talk alike. We have different ages, different income levels, different education levels. It shouldn't work. I just spent a weekend, Beth and I, as the only two white faces in a a room room packed with African-Americans. You know what? I was more comfortable there than I am in a white gathering in Florida. Because that's family. That shouldn't work. That's oneness. You understand? That's oneness. That's family. And it breaks my heart when I feel it, when I'm there. That they may be one even as we are. On an infinitely lesser scale, maybe it's something like when Beth and I do music and it's just Beth and me and it's so easy. You know, we move together, we feel together, we breathe together, it flows without effort. We almost never need rehearsal when it's just the two of us. Even when we're doing the more difficult music we do at Christmas. People tell us that it ministers a quality of peace to them that we haven't found in any other configuration. I'm not saying the band isn't great, the band is great, I loved it this morning, but there's something that happens when it's Beth and me. Maybe it's a bit like the way Beth and I can sense one another and feel one another and what's happening 
over thousands of miles when we're apart. Or when we, we can feel the hurt that a word or an action will cause the other even before we do it and so we choose not to do it or not to say it. God doesn't ask us to be the same. In oneness, he doesn't ask us to be alike. Could two more different people ever have gotten married than Lauren and Beth? Dear Lord, I used to say that Eeyore married Tinkerbell. Except that Eeyore is permanently dead. Long live Tigger, but. They asked me in England 10 years ago, I was ministering in England and they said, uh, what's your wife like? What, what do you like? And I said, well, imagine this. Mick Jagger married Mary Poppins. And they laughed for a whole week. I thought, why is that so funny? Oneness is not sameness. Real oneness actually accentuates the glory of the individuals who are one. It sets us free. When I was a kid, I'd watch my mother and my father dancing gracefully together perfect fluid motion, sensing one another's movements and flowing together without any kind of hesitation or resistance. What if hundreds of people, what if hundreds of people in a congregation or a city could move beyond just the absence of conflict or beyond mere agreement about direction? What if they could grow into the kind of resonant oneness with one another that Jesus has with the Father God? What if that could happen? What if our worship, what if our worship looked like God himself standing like a choir director, moving us all in unison instead of some of them engaged and some of them holding back. Or, or his spirit singing back to the Father and the Son through our mouths. What kind of power might be released in that kind of oneness of focus? John seventeen twenty, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, you know, they went out to preach to both Jews and Gentiles who were called to be one new man. He was asking the Father for that oneness to be perfected. Verse 21, that they may all be one even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. See, the power outcome of oneness is that people believe our message. People, there's a world out there starving for any kind of love. And if they could see it in us, you wouldn't have to go say, do you know where you're going if you died tonight? <laughs> what a dumb approach. I mean, it works for some people. But the enemy has successfully told this culture that they're all going to heaven because they're all good people, right? What they're needing is the love. They need that revelation. Verse 22, the glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one just as we are one. The glory is the oneness. Whoa, you know, we're crying out for glory. We want revival. Lord, send your glory. The glory is the oneness. I've given them the same glory that you gave me in our oneness. We pray for the glory to come, but the glory given to us is the glory the Father gave Jesus. That's oneness with one another and with him. That radiant goodness of God flowing out of us, reflecting the image of God just as we are one, as we were designed to do from the moment that we were created. This is the dying prayer of Jesus. Verse 23, I in them and you in me that they may be perfected in unity so that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. Matthew 18, 19, and 20. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered together in my name, I am there in their midst. God looks down, sees his own image reflected in the mirror of our oneness and says, I can bless that. What it means is that we discern together in our oneness what Jesus is saying. We come together in oneness in our prayer. We discern what Jesus is saying and we agree in our oneness that we're hearing the same thing and then we ask and God sees himself in our oneness. You know, when Peter, this, this thing about, well, Peter went on to say, actually, he went on to say, he went on to question God, you know, um, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Peter was looking for a way out of this. 
Up to seven times, Jesus said to him, I did not say to you, up to seven times, up to 70 times seven. Listen. Because he'd, Peter had been hanging out with those other 11 idiots for three and a half years. And he had plenty of objections, plenty of reasons not to trust them. So he's looking for a way out. The issue wasn't forgiveness, the issue was agreement. That special quality of oneness that releases power. That unity that looks like God and that God respects and the price we have to pay to get it and keep it. And so Jesus said, no, you don't forgive him seven times and give up on him. 70 times seven, seven is a number of fullness. So fullness upon fullness upon fullness, that's how often you forgive him. Because oneness is more important than anything else. I had, a, I had an associate pastor when I was in Idaho. We had some kind of an argument. He thought I'd said something negative about him. And I had not said anything about him. The words weren't even words I would use. And in one of our meetings, we were arguing back and forth. I'd say, I didn't say that. He'd say, yes, you did. I'd, no, I didn't. Yes, you did. Went back and forth. He finally got up from across the room and he said, I don't care what you said. Nothing is more important than our relationship. And he came across the room and he embraced me. And I'm saying that's something we need to say to one another when there's been conflict or disagreement. Huh? We need to, I'm talking husband to wife. I'm talking wife to husband. I'm talking church member to church member people to pastor, pastor to people. I don't care what you said or what you didn't say. Our relationship is more important than any of that. So here's what I want to do today. And this is the really important part. I want to put a slide up here. Um, yeah, you ready to do that? Because I think we're at the point now We've enjoyed weeks now of a oneness that we've never experienced before. And I think we're at the point where there's some demonic spirits that have afflicted this church from the time that we were planted and it is time for us to rise up as a people and say no more and command those things to leave. I'm not talking about commanding an attitude to leave, I'm talking about actual demonic presences that it is, we now have the base, we now have the foundation, we now have the authority to say be gone. And this is the way I wanna do it. I'm gonna come down here. And I want us to gather as a people down front. I'm gonna ask Donna to just maybe even just play the chords to uh, one day. And, uh, and with each one of those things, the spirit of criticism, whoops, we just, <laughs> there we go. Spirit of criticism, spirit of division, spirit of separation, spirit of offense, spirit of undermining, spirit of dishonor, spirit of rejection. This is the revelation the Lord gave me over the weekend when I was at that conference. And I want at least one person as we gather, we're gonna gather up front. You can be doing that right now if you want. At least one person to take responsibility for each of those, I'm gonna give you the mic and you're gonna command that thing to leave. Right? Here I stand before you, Lord, with my arms outstretched and my heart wide open. There's a new song in my mouth. It's a joy that sings. It's a free